what, we're, what I'd like for you to do now is for you to say uh, what your expectation is for this meeting. What do you want to make sure we absolutely get done tonight? That should be easy. No expectations, huh? No, only from the, only from the technical <laughs> working group. <laughs> I think we need to get a plan that can pass the city council okay. on October 17th. Get a plan that can pass the city council in 2017. Sorry, yes, sir. I'm sorry, 19. <laughs> <laughs> Two years behind. Yes, sir. That, after, that we have the tools, whether within or outside the plan, to make sure that implementation actually happens, that the implementation process is clear. So that you have to have the tools so that the implementation process is clear and possible. Somebody had her hand. Yes, sir. Um, I, th I think it's important that we have a plan um, structured so it's balanced. I mean, we've all heard some of the pros and cons to the plan that was published and so forth. And so what I'd like to see is can we come up with something that is somewhat balanced so that we have buy-in from the various external groups. Okay. So you want a balanced plan that you can get by in from different <coughs> groups? Yes. Okay. yes yeah, I, I'd like to see um, whether we can come up with a list of things that we can actually get incorporated into the new private development code uh, during the future process. Okay. So you want a list of things that could be incorporated into the revisions of the Unified Development Code. I don't think we'll get to that detail, but we can definitely put that as one of the things to do because we, we, we're not, I'm not thinking that we'll get to that level of list, uh, of detail where we're making a list, that kind of a list, but we can definitely put that as one of the things that would happen as part of this process. Okay. Yes, ma'am, way back there. I don't know if it's an expectation, but uh, my desire would be for the come out of this with a plan that accurately acknowledges the state of the climate and climate science and what that implies for emissions reductions. Okay, so a plan that accurately acknowledges what the situation is scientifically and what was the last part of that? And what that means for emissions reductions. And what that means for emissions reduction, okay. Somebody else had a hand? Yes, sir. No, uh, you and then, and then you. I think one of the things that I would like to leave this meeting with is a sense of how to be, how to best be an advocate for the plan um, in conversations with people who I think ought to know better. Uh, I've heard things like, uh, I'm on the board of such and such corporation who says that they'll leave San Antonio if the plan passes. And I've said to this person, you realize that it's a framework, not a set of regulations. And um, at the same time, there's this sense of, yeah. of immediate digging and appeals. So I'd like to understand, I'd like to be able to best represent the plan and I think uh, the changes that have been made uh, so that I can have that conversation effectively. How to be an advocate for the plan. Okay. Excuse me. I'd like to know the changes that were made since the last draft and okay. why those changes. Okay, so we want to see what the changes were and why they were made. Okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Soul of America. Oh, yeah, okay. It's time for public comment. Okay. If you'll, uh, I think Greg, and who was the other person who wanted to make a public comment? No? Okay. Greg, you want I can, to? I can wait till the steering on Wednesday, too. I mean, if there's... Okay. To eat up your time. All right. I mean, if you're okay with doing that. Yeah, I came tonight, I guess, very briefly out of a deep concern over how CPS emissions are now framed how they were originally. We were a lot, uh, a lot of people came in. If you look in the back of the current draft, uh, I think there's a lot of pride or a lot of justification for the plan taken in how many public comments came out in support of climate action. 
uh, the number one comment received was one for very specific interim goal reductions based around shutting down the coal plant, moving off of natural gas, fired electricity, and the like uh, with deadlines. Um, that's what we were fighting for then. That obviously didn't happen, and actually we went backwards. Uh, the only interim targets now, um, which are not what we asked for, are by sector, uh, and transportation uh, is being held accountable for, I think it's 47% reductions in like 12 years, or and it's just literally not possible. The only way we can get the reductions that we need are going to the, so the point source of those emissions, and that's our coal plant, and that's our gas plants. Um, so I just don't think it's a, the, the plan as it's written um, uh, is honest in terms of what we can accomplish uh, unless we go back and revisit uh, the issue of CPS energy. And I feel shame on CPS for coming in at the last minute and kind of working this out so that the flexible plan is the guiding vision of San Antonio when it's woefully inadequate for getting us to zero by 2050. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anybody else have any, any of the public have any other comments? Okay. Okay, thank you. Then what we'll do now is we're gonna, any, uh, I'll have the presentation, Doug's gonna do the presentation. So this presentation will be fairly high level, just to provide a framework of some of the rationale as far as why, um, sort of a bit of the process and some of the new content that was put into the plan. Um, there was lots of little edits made throughout the documents, um, but I won't go into all of those details. Uh, you know, so what was our objective uh, as far as updating the plan? Uh, I'll just sort of read through these. We wanted to reflect stakeholder, broad stakeholder engagement. Um, from various mechanisms um, that we wanted to make sure that we were capturing and reflecting. Um, that's okay. We want to ensure that the plan is consistent with the objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement uh, resolution that Council had, had adopted. We wanted to ensure that we retain all the strategies uh, that were outlined in the initial draft. This is really the big one, uh, improving readability um, and flow, uh, which was a there was a lot of redundancy, there was a lot of um, challenges with how the initial draft was, was laid out, um, and so we really wanted to address that. Um, the other thing that we heard was the plan wasn't San Antonio, uh, and so we really wanted to go in and, and provide new contents, um, new images that were more consistent with San Antonio. Uh, somebody mentioned this before, you know, the, the need for identifying a clear process um, for reporting updating the plan and implementation, and again, delivering an updated draft that considers the diversity of input from across sectors and serves as a foundation for climate action. And finally, and perhaps the most important, delivering a plan to city council that can be adopted. Uh, we really want to make sure that when we go to council October 17th, I believe, and we'll have a timeline that I can show in a, in a minute, that this is a plan that's going to be supported, supported so we can start moving swiftly on implementation, and as the councilwoman had, had mentioned, we're already implementing, but, but we really need to, 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 to accelerate that. This blurry slide, um, I apologize. One of the things we heard from different um, folks was that they'd read through the plan and they had no idea what it was. Um, nowhere did we say what, what this is. So early in this current update, we just provide a, a quick synopsis. You know, what is this plan? It's our climate action adaptation plan addressing future challenges about economic prosperity and quality of life. Um, I won't go down the list, but again, it, it provides that clear focus as far as what this document is that you're looking at and what the intent is. So some of the other feedback that we've received um, from different stakeholders and some folks in the public was that while the plan has all these great strategies in it, it didn't acknowledge some of the um, constraints um, and one of the things we were really trying to do with this plan is provide a, a, a balance set a very um, firm target where we need to be um, but to at the same time acknowledge that none of this is going to be easy there's, there's still lots of question marks that we need to um, address as we move forward to implementation 
So putting some clear language acknowledging that technology is an issue. Um, we have lots of technology now that can do lots of things. Um, we may not have all the technological solutions at this point in time. We need to acknowledge that. Um, there's costs. Um, there's also benefits. Uh, we need to make sure that as we move forward, we're acknowledging uh, the broad uh, implications of, of the plan. And again, it's not just costs, but we also want to um, quantify as best we can going forward cost avoidance, what's the cost of not doing anything? Um, what are all the fiscal implications of co-benefits? The challenge we have now is that analysis doesn't really exist um, to really come up with that comprehensive um, economic analysis, but putting it in the plan to acknowledge that those are things that we need to continue to move forward on. And then finally, the idea of, you know, this is really about where our community is going statewide, nationally, globally, there's a shift. There's a, there's a change that's going on in terms of consumer um, uh, desires, and we want to make sure that we acknowledge that, one, you know, it's not just a challenge that we need to acknowledge in terms of overcoming that barrier, it's also an opportunity that more and more people want um, many of the, the strategies that are outlined in this plan. So this balances out that sort of reality check one of the things we really wanted to strengthen is um, we're already doing this. And this is on the, on the left, you see some of the track record of investments. That's just a few of them. One of the things we really wanted to put out there to the public is this isn't necessarily anything new. This, this community has been investing billions of dollars for a really long time in proactive action um, that has, quite frankly, climate benefit. We haven't called it climate, but whether we're talking about the work of BSAG, both Senator Green, Edwards Act for Protection Program, STEP Program, the Greenway, we're investing billions and billions of dollars. And so we wanted to acknowledge that we're doing it, and this plan basically provides us a framework for continuing to do that under the umbrella of climate. The other thing we also wanted to boost was sort of that rationale and the urgency of why we're doing this. And so we did find a couple of other um, fiscal implications um, under the cost of doing nothing that you can see we're talking, whether we're talking about health risks or heat exposure or impacts on infrastructure, we're talking billions of dollars. Um, and that data source came from the document that was prepared by EPA that actually went into the latest national climate assessment. So even EPA did an economic analysis, and this is for, for our, our region. And then the last thing that we had added was there's a lot of um, uh, research and um, basic statements from lots of organizations um, that really focus on why we need to do this, whether it's the insurance market, uh, whether it's through public health sectors, bond ratings, national security, world heritage. There's lots of external forces that are saying this is important, you need to do it. So we really wanted to, to acknowledge that. So this is something that um, we took a lot of time looking at. Um, Greg had mentioned that the addition to this plan, the current draft, is including the um, interim reduction targets by, by sector for 2030 to 2040. Um, we also included more language in the plan really citing the um, IPCC 1.5 um, degree report um, and uh, acknowledging that we need to continually to um, track and reflect and update the plan based upon um, emerging climate science. I also want to touch briefly on the curve that we put the straight line pathway and just to clarify what we're looking at, there's been conversation around wanting to see the, the diagram on the left, and this is from the IPCC 1.5 report. Um, and on the right, um, we see um, pathways from some cities, um, San Antonio in blue, and you can see Los Angeles in red, New York in green, Houston in purple. purple. Um, one real key thing to acknowledge is the difference in scale. So why doesn't our pathway look like, like that? One of the things we've been looking at is the, the axis, axis on that diagram goes from 2010 to 2100, whereas ours goes to 20, from 2016 to 2050. Um, also on the, is it Y that goes up, the Y axis? Um, that basically on the left is in the billions um, for global emissions, and ours on the right is for San Antonio in the, in the millions of tons. 
So there's a difference of scale. The other thing I also wanted to point out, you can see if you take a look at New York or if you look at Houston, they have much steeper curves. Um, basically, the more emissions that a community has, the steeper the, the reduction is needed to get to um, 2050. Um, we're still looking at this. Um, we've, we've, we've reached out to C40 cities just to have, have a conversation with them uh, to make sure that we're on the right track. But I, mean, I think at the end of the day, this is a really key um, piece, and we want to make sure we're on the, all on the same page. Um, so it's something that we're, we're continuing to look at. So I'm not going to go into all the mitigation edits. Uh, it's something that we can talk about in this um, in, in this discussion as we go forward. Just want to highlight some of the different edits. We did remove the investment numbers. The, when we first put in the investment numbers, what, what our hope was, if you look at the initial scope of work, it was to do a cost-benefit analysis that had costs, quantified all the co-benefits, quantified all the cost avoidance of not taking action, and basically at the end of the day, when we were sort of informed that we couldn't get that, 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 that it wasn't possible as a part of this process, we were left with the investment number. Um, and it painted a picture that wasn't necessarily accurate. Um, so we removed that. Um, I think a lot of people also that we spoke to thought that it was appropriate as this is a framework, that this is a, it's a starting point for figuring out um, how we're going to implement it. So it's sort of preemptively put dollar signs in it is, is premature. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more how we address that um, in the next few slides. Um, these strategies, we did clarify a lot of the language. One of the things we wanted to do was allow um, as much uh, technological advance as built into the strategies and not limit it to just one, but the intent is that you know, it, it's a, as encompassing as possible to really strive towards strategies that are going to reduce carbon the best. Um, and then we did look at removing targets. We thought there was a real lot of inconsistency um, across the plan where just several strategies had targets and the rest didn't. And so we decided to go back at a sector-based um, approach, which would really allow us to um, focus on implementing strategies across the sector uh, as opposed to focusing on any specific strategies. Key to this, though, is that we have to remember is this is a living document. Uh, we're talking about updating the inventory every two years and reporting it so we can see progress. And the plan will also be updated every three to five years. So this is just our first plan um, that will set the stage. And then we're going to have a regular process uh, by how we, we continue to move it forward and update it. So this was another new piece of the plan. And it, it, it sort of reflects some of the previous, uh, one of the previous slides where we really wanted to assure broad sectors of stakeholders that this plan wasn't simply this the word I want to use, a, um, just a list of mandates that's going to get adopted and it just becomes um, a blank check, that there's a process in place for implementation, which we at the staff level assumed was how we would do it. It just didn't say it. So what we had proposed including in the plan is, um, you can see on the bottom diagram outlining a specific strategy, and I'll talk a little bit about how we identify these, these priorities, but Annual, um, annually identified priority strategies, convene our diverse stakeholders across sectors, undertake our cost benefit analysis, undertake our climate equity assessment, get more community input, make any adjustments, and by the time we bring something to council, hopefully we have all of those answers in place. But, and so clearly we want to identify what are all those costs, co-benefits, cost avoidance, acknowledge technology, also something got cut off, I should say, um, equity and affordability, as well as really showing a clear timeline for implementation and the expected carbon reduction. So we really just wanted to outline what the process is so there's no misunderstanding. So this is a really busy slide, um, and I apologize. It sort of it just outlines some of the organizational and governance structures that we're proposing. Um, the first thing that we have, had added is we added the, the term technical to the community advisory committee. What, where, why the community is key to being part of this, this advisory committee. We also wanted to stress that a lot of this is driven by um, technical expertise. We want to make sure that we have a, a good mix of, of people around the table that can help us as we move forward on implementation. We also clarified that the meetings of this committee would be public, they would be public, and that they would be providing an annual progress report to city council. So there's a um, confirmation and a report to council on what we're doing and how we're doing and what's working and what isn't working. 
And then the, um, the committee has the ability to develop um, subcommittees. Uh, so if they are focusing on a specific um, strategy that needs additional expertise, they have the authority to, to create that committee. On the climate side, if you remember the Climate Equity Committee, oh, I'm, going, I'm going way over, sorry. Um, the Climate Equity Committee used to be a subcommittee. And then we heard from um, some of the Equity Committee members that they'd like to see it as a standalone committee on its own, um, as opposed to being part of the, the other one. We thought that was, was reasonable. Um, so basically, it will be a separate um, independent group that will work with, uh, with us and the other committee. Then we really wanted to figure out a way to try to institutionalize um, the climate plan within the city organization. And so we had proposed creating an executive team, basically be an assistant city manager and appropriate department directors at a high level to really, again, working with the other committees, what are our priorities, and really ensuring that we're shepherding the plan forward. Looking at all things from future policies, current programs, budget, make sure that this is high profile. And then there is a, um, we're proposing a, a, a COSA delivery team that would be more at the, at the mid um, uh, departmental director level, folks who are responsible for actually getting projects and strategies done on the ground. Those bottom two things were actually, I had seen Fort Collins um, had a really nice um, structure in place and it seemed like a good, a good approach. So this is the big slide. Um, today we're chatting with you. We're going to take everything that you say um, today and uh, tomorrow. We're going to look at it and figure out what we do with it. And basically on um, the 14th, um, make our recommendations to the steering committee uh, and see what, what they think. Um, I'll be presenting to um, City Council uh, at a, a session on the 22nd. It's just a briefing, um, not for, uh, for action. Uh, then we'll be releasing, the, the plan is basically out. So, um, but basically it'll be the official full public release of the plan on the 22nd. Um, have to go to planning commission two times. Uh, one is just a uh, informal work session um, briefing them and then looking for a, a recommendation from them. Um, then going to Community Health and Equity, September 20th, and then uh, Council B session, October 2nd, and then City Council A session, uh, the 17th. It was the 10th, but it's Texas Municipal League week that week, so that's why we had to um, adjust it. Uh, but that is just the high level. Um, any initial questions? Clarifying questions on that? Are there any clarifying questions? Yes. I was wondering if anyone from the Chamber of Commerce has reviewed a copy of the plan, and I was just kind of wondering just if you had some input from the business community on it and what you think about it. Yep. So basically for the past three months or so, we've just been meeting with the chambers and different um, business stakeholders. Um, you know, what their, some of their concerns I outlined, you know, the idea of process, what does this plan mean and what do we do with it. Um, the idea of, what was I just going to say, um, some of the other concerns were, of course they want to see as much flexibility as, as possible, which isn't, isn't surprising. Um, I mean, everyone that we met with, nobody said they didn't want it or don't think we shouldn't be doing it. I think they had the, the concerns that um, making it clear that it's a framework um, and I think also wanting, I, their, I think their big thing was implementation. How are we actually going to be moving this thing forward? So I think the big discussion that we're going to have over the next month with all of you and, and others is getting some more detail on that governance structure. You know, who is on the, you know, who, what are the slots on the committees? What is the, the process for getting them, um, getting people appointed? Because that's going to be the group that's really going to drive a lot of this. So I think everybody has concerns about that. Any other clarifying questions? And I'll be floating around um, this evening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just um, very new to specific strategy target. Um, I'm wondering why did you just increase them instead of removing them? It seems like it would be a more powerful, effective plan if we had more targets? I think the concern was the 
number of strategies and the ability to come up with reasonable targets for all of them, we didn't think we could come up with those. We thought that, and again, I think the other thing is looking at this as our first plan that's starting at the higher level sectors seemed like a good first step. I think we're, like one of the things that we're really going to need to do through implementation, and again, working with these additional advisory committees, is really start narrowing down those specific targets um, um, as we move forward. So I think at this point, we didn't feel that we had that the information or the data to put targets throughout the entire, entire plan. Just the gentleman back there on that side, yeah. And, and um, I had a little bit of concern with um, the near-term priority actions being removed. It seemed like um, just from that from that page with the yes. And I don't know if they like found themselves someplace else. Yep. Okay. They're, they're, they're still in the um, the spreadsheet uh, of all the strategy of all the strategies are identified as near term or um, long term. We just took them out of that. They were reiterated. Some of them were reiterated on that, that the page that had the reduction yeah, pathway. Yeah, because I was talking to people and they were saying it would be easier to buy in if they can see what the first bites are going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, the low hanging fruit or what do you want to call it to kind of get the ball rolling. It'd be easier to see the long term stuff if the first term stuff was out there spelled out and doable. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Doug, if you, uh, you commented on the chamber, have you been uh, meeting with uh, your partner agencies such as the CBS Energy Board, the VIA Boards, to get their feedback and uh, whether they buy in or not from these uh, SAWS boards, from these other things that are very closely tied to the city, yet separate? Yeah, I'm going, I think we're going to them, all three of them, in the next couple weeks. Um, but you have, you have we've, we've, had com we've had conversations at the staff level, but not, not with the, um, the actual boards. So you don't know anything of what the actions are? Um, just through staff comments. Uh, yes. Um, in the draft, you've changed the language about public outreach, because now we're not in the stakeholder sort of feedback step, but we're in the, what was it, inform, educate and empower, or educate and enable? Yeah. Okay, I feel like that's a very important part of this plan that we haven't, at least in our working group, we haven't had an opportunity to discuss specifically, because that's what the question? Way. What's your so question? So the question is, can, since you didn't mention it in this, I, I'm giving it, I'm, I'm giving it priority because I feel like that's a, among our first actions that we can take, and in particular in terms of some of the issues raised by the business. What's the question? <coughs> well, the question is, what do we? Can you? Can we talk about topics that aren't there, like the empower? I don't even remember the words right now. Educate, educate, and, empower. Mm -hmm. educate and empower. Yep, I mean, that's my question. I think we, we, sure. we, can, we can talk more about that when we start talking about implementation. Okay. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna move now into working in the work group. So if y'all will turn the cameras off, please.